All right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, just for fun, today I'm going to critique this video. Pastor John Hagee, The Road to Armageddon. All right, so what I did, I was looking through it, and I got about three minutes into it, and I thought, well, you know, it'd be fun just to sort of go step by step and, um, you know, sort of examine what Hagee is saying. Now, just a, a brief summary. Hagee is somebody who thinks Jerusalem is in the Middle East and not in heaven above. All right, but the the Bible's very clear that that Jerusalem, our Jerusalem is not in the Middle East, okay? Galatians 4, verse 26, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. It should be very obvious. Um, you know, we can go to John 14 and numerous other places in Revelation um, where a new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. Uh, it's not in the Middle East. That place is dirty, filthy. And... Um, Obviously, people that um, claim to have a, a bloodline to Abraham uh, have no bloodline whatsoever. Uh, we all have the bloodline to Abraham. Abraham has a bloodline to Noah. Noah has a bloodline to Adam. And the bloodline will never save anybody. Period. We've always been saved by grace and saved by grace through faith not of ourselves it is the gift of God it has always been by faith and it's all we've always been at the mercy of God <laughs> nobody's ever saved themselves it's always been by the grace of God okay and it's amazing that somebody so popular and so rich and with such a great influence can't understand the very simple things uh, such as that so let's go get into this all right so um, I'm just gonna scroll down here he talks about uh, the new world order fancy right the Bible portrait of the new world order from the day Satan was kicked out of heaven for his rebellion against God Almighty he has attempted to establish a new world order that will totally rebel against the authority of God in Genesis chapter 3 Adam and Eve rebelled against God's spiritual authority God said don't eat of the fruit of that tree it's forbidden so the forbidden thing did they did and they ate the fruit angels with flaming swords drove them out of paradise into a world of sin, sickness, and suffering, and we have been suffering because of their decisions. In Genesis 7, Noah's generation failed God so that God became so disgusted with humanity, he drowned the world. There were eight souls saved in the ark. Eight is a magical number uh, of the new world order. Can be traced to chapter 11 where Nimrod built the Tower of Babel. What was the purpose of the, this tower? The purpose of the tower was to remove God from the face of the earth, to worship the mother child cult. Why we're covering from Adam Armageddon, and this is where we begin. God Almighty commanded Abraham to leave his father's house because his father was an idol worshiper. All right, just before I go any further, this stuff here, with the, so they could worship the mother-child cult, that's not in the Bible, okay? <laughs> um, here, I got to do this. I, I don't like to even waste my time on this subject here, but think about it. Nimrod. Let's see, in Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. 
And in First Chronicles 1, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty upon the earth. Okay. And then Micah 5. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod, and the entrances thereof, the land of Nimrod. Okay, so let's open up. Let's work backwards here. First Corinthians, or First uh, Chronicles 10. All right. And that's all it says about Nimrod. Okay, keep that in mind. And then Genesis 10. We get two verses. Let's see. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, and Akkad, and blah, 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 blah. All right. So, and Ku, there, there it is. Okay, so Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be mighty on the earth. Okay, and then mighty hunter, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Okay. Now, this is just going through all the people. Uh, the families and so on. Okay, so uh, I'm, okay. I'm going to go back to that. Hold on a second. Okay. To worship the mother child cult. That's not in the Bible. Okay. His father was an idol worshiper. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is not a recommendation and is absolute command. <clears throat> okay, so that's true, but it's. I need to point out here that that um, commandment was made after Abraham, just so there's clarity. Okay, just so there's clarity. Because we can get into all sorts of other stuff, but it is it, it to me it's important to understand uh, when the commandments of God were established. It matters. Okay. First Corinthians ten says, "My dearly beloved, flee from idolatry." All right, this is coming from a guy who is extremely rich. Okay, that's just that's just rich. If you um, if you uh, love anything more than Jesus Christ, uh, or whatever, blah blah blah. Okay, so <laughs> if anybody loves the world, the love of God is not in him. All right, and this this thing here of well, if you love this more than Jesus, no 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 no. no. No, no, no. That's not what. That's not what the Bible says. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So it's it's not about do you love Jesus more than you love your Lamborghini? Well, you could say, no, I love Jesus more. I got I got four Lamborghinis, and I love Jesus more than all four of them Lamborghinis. Now hold on a second. <laughs> Something's not quite right here. Alright. I'm not saying he's got four Lamborghinis. I'm just making a point. He might have four Lam Lamborghinis. He can afford it, right? All right, anyways. Love not the world. There's very little to measure there. All right, when you say, if you love Jesus more than your stuff, that's kind of hard to measure more than, well, I love Jesus ten times and I only love these cars nine times. I mean, how do you measure that? It's very simple when you read the scripture and you believe what it says and when it says love not the world, that means love not the world. That's zero. Right? This world's going to pass away. Okay. Alright, then he, innocent man 
Oh, in Hebrew, all right, right. So right here, when he says anything Nimrod's name in Hebrew means, all right, okay, in Hebrew means revolt. Nimrod's name in Hebrew means revolt. Well, uh, anybody that points to the Hebrew exposes themselves as somebody that does not believe the Bible they hold in their hands. All right, there, otherwise, there'd be no reason at all to point to the Hebrew. If you believe the Bible you hold in your hands is directly from God, there's no reason at all to go to the Hebrew. None whatsoever. Number one, you don't know any ancient Hebrew, period. Even if you knew a little bit of he modern Hebrew, that's not the same as ancient Hebrew. And uh, I'm guessing you don't know modern Hebrew at all. And it's amazing to me how many people pretend to be experts in languages they don't have any idea of. None whatsoever. And it doesn't matter anyways. All right, so you're saying that God speaks in modern Hebrew? Because modern Hebrew is not the same as ancient Hebrew. Modern Hebrew is a, a little over 100 years old. If God can speak modern Hebrew, then why can't God speak English? Uh, just from a logical standpoint, doesn't make any sense. Now, if, they're, if you're trying to appear to be holy and have extra knowledge and wisdom above every man, you know, if you're full of pride, then I can understand why you're pointing to Greek and Hebrew, trying to fool people. But all you're really doing is fooling yourself. All right. I mean, this is kind of a big deal. It kind of really is. Because if you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, how are you going to understand the Word of God? Even unto this day when Moses is read, <clears throat> excuse me, the veil is upon their heart because they don't believe what they read. That's why. Now, we could all read it, believers and unbelievers. But the key is believing. It's always been believing. All right, in 1 Corinthians 14, and this is uh, parallel to what we read in Isaiah somewhere. In Isaiah 28, for with steaming lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. In 1 Corinthians, uh, where are we at? 1 Corinthians 14, and the law is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. With men of other tongues and other lips. All right, and let's real quickly here. I mean, it's all over the place, right? The day of Pentecost, cloven tongues. How hear we? Every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. The Word of God transcends all languages for all time, forever and ever. All right, and even Paul tells us, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. In ancient Hebrews, a Hebrew is a language that has ceased doesn't exist I mean it's dead it's a dead language nobody can understand it yeah I, I have a hard enough time understanding English I got no chance at all to understand these dead languages none whatsoever neither do you all right my only hope is that God is able to speak the one and only language that I know. And I believe, there's no doubt in my mind that, that we have the Word of God in our language, in our own tongue wherein we were born. All right, and then, of course, all the languages of the world will one day come to an end after the resurrection and the world to come. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. This happens after the end of the world. Okay? 
when death is done away with forever. All right, so I just want to cover that. What? Why are you Hebrew? Well, in the Hebrew, it means this. Well, I wouldn't know that unless you told me, John. So do I got to depend on you, or should I depend on God? See, these guys are phony, in my opinion. Every single one of them that point to a foreign language. So I don't know. They could be lying to me. I wouldn't know. They could show me a piece of paper that says this says, means that. Well, why not just say that instead of showing me what the foreign language says? Well, a dog in Hebrew means how blah, blah, blah. Well, I know what a dog means in English. That's all I need to know. Why would I need to know what it, what dog means in Hebrew? It doesn't make any sense. What, you know, so you could say, well, Nimrod's name means revolt. What, why even go to the Hebrew? You know, well, Nimrod's name in Hebrew is blah, 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 blah. And that means revolt. Blah, 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 blah means revolt. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Why not just say Nimrod's name means revolt? Why throw in the Hebrew unless you want to subtly deceive people and fool them? Hey, I'm smart. I know stuff that you don't. I mean, why? That, that, that's the only reason. Pride. Arrogance. De deceit. That's the only reason. I'm telling you right now, I'm too dumb to know anything in Hebrew. And there's an old saying it's all greek to me in other words i have no idea what hebrew is i have no idea what greek means all right i get fired up about that i really do because you're lying to a lot of people very subtly you're lying to a lot of people what you're saying in essence is that you can't trust the bible that you hold in your hands. You're suggesting that that Bible that you hold in your hands is not from God. You have to go to a foreign dead language to know what God says. And you're not going to do that. You're just going to depend on John Hagee to, to know what God says. Just J John, whatever John says, that's what God says. So you're putting your trust in John Hagee and not putting your trust in God Almighty. You might say, well, I trust God. Well, if you think John Hagee is God, of course, then you're telling the truth. You trust God. But I guarantee you, John Hagee is not God. All right. All right, so let's, let's move on. Let's keep going here. Later known as the city of Babylon, historian Joseph. And that's interesting. Is he going to, he's going to, okay. I ain't quoted, okay, never mind. I don't know why why not just stick to the Bible John okay historian Josephus said of Nimrod listen quote he gradually changed the government into tyranny and turned men from the fear of God to bring them into constant dependence on his own power the purpose was total control really nothing has control our government when COVID-19 came out totally control us they control the church they control the school <laughs> and blah, blah 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 get your mind wandering on that for a little bit now let's back up Nimrod quote listen he gradually changed the government into tyranny well hold on a second hold on a second all right Hold on a second. You guys know about Joseph? I, and I'm not talking about Josephus. I'm not talking about Josephus. I'm talking about Joseph. You know, in Genesis, uh, when it talks the, about the coat of many... Oopsie, oopsie, oopsie. I don't know how to spell. See, I got trouble with English. You want me to learn Hebrew? Well, <clears throat> I guess my internet don't work anymore, so I'll just keep talking. So the story of um, Joseph 
is that he got sold to the Egyptians and then became uh, very powerful. Okay. And he had a dream, Joseph the dreamer, had a dream, or it wasn't, it wasn't him that had the dream, excuse me. It was uh, Pharaoh that had a dream. This is crazy. I got, I got crazy good dial-up internet. Okay. So, uh, Pharaoh had a dream, seven years of plenty. Uh, seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine right so because Joseph had established himself and Pharaoh had uh, great trust in him he he put him in charge of this operation where they were going to store grain for seven years right now, so if you go and look at, uh, was it Joser? Joser, uh, this is Joseph's pyramid here. Okay, and if you were to do like a Google Earth sort of thing, you could see how they were able to store so much grain in just that one area. All right. And it, it's crazy. Anyways, there, there's an example of how far down right next to that pyramid of Djoser goes. And so that for seven years they were able to store a massive amount of corn or grain. Or whatever okay and so after the seven years then there was a famine for seven years match I mean one year is bad seven years is traumatic I mean devastating and so what happened was men from all around uh, started selling their land started selling their animals and then even sold their own souls for grain All right, now this is a significant time period significant all right let me see if I can find that I'm not sure is it sell or sold or something sold let's see if we can find something to support I oh, don't know. I don't remember now. They were selling. Oh, maybe I'm using the wrong word here. Maybe I'm using the wrong word here. They sold themselves. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm wasting time here. I'm blabbering on. Da 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 da. Sold all the people land and took them. Bounced around the face of the earth. Oh, anyways, you'll have to read it for yourself. For the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. All right. All right. Um, anyways, um, boy, um, okay. Nevertheless, okay. So that's what happened. Okay. So Joseph and and the Pharaoh and the Egyptians became extremely powerful. All right, um, because of the seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, they uh, in that time period they gained so much power. It was it had to have been incredible. 
absolute power. And then, of course, 420 years, the Hebrew people were enslaved by the Egyptians, and Moses delivered them out of that wicked situation. situation. And so also, will Jesus lead us out of our wicked situation? Okay. There's parallels there uh, that are very fascinating in my opinion. Anyways, let's let's go on. But so what John Hagee is saying here is that um, Nimrod did all this. Well, well, hold on a second here. You think about this. Um, you know, Joseph, the dreamer, was in Genesis uh, 37 give or take and then we read here Nimrod and Genesis 10 so who came later who gained more power I mean if you consider he began he began um, uh, he began to be mighty upon the earth and then of course um, what was the other verse that I was looking for uh, I forget now oh yeah uh, and this was the beginning of his kingdom the beginning of the kingdom all right, so is it you going to credit Nimrod for obtaining all this power, or really you ought to give credit to God through Joseph for the power that was obtained during that time of the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine? Uh, which was really genius and a power move a big time power move all right and we see well i don't want to get into all the stuff going on in the world today but we see that uh, same sort of philosophy occurring today power grabs power moves this was an extreme power move all right, so anyways, I mean, you're, you're putting all this attention on Nimrod, and he's barely mentioned the Bible at all. Meanwhile, there's this whole great big deal with Joseph. I mean, the whole thing is just so fascinating. And not only that, the evidence of Joseph, of Joseph is, is very fascinating. I don't know. Okay. I, so he teaches different. That's fine. But I'm telling you, if this stuff is really interesting, learn about Joseph, not the historian Josephus. Well, you can't trust Josephus. There's no way I would try. I've never read Josephus. Don't care to ever read anything that Josephus has written. The Bible has it all. Really. And you want to learn and grow? Then believe. The Bible that you hold in your hands. Okay. All right. Tyranny. Blah blah blah. 9/11. Oh, COVID-19. Whatever. Blah blah blah. Well, I tell you what. This guy here. I mean, if I'm gonna get in trouble for making false medical information about COVID-19, what? Well, why is this guy still on YouTube? He's making these crazy claims. That false medical information right there, John Hagee. He should be shunned from all society. COVID-19. Well, I'll tell you right now, I had COVID-18. It wasn't as bad as COVID-19, but it was pretty bad. You have to wear a mask. You'd be six feet under, or six feet away, whatever. I mean, look at this false medical information. John Hagee, I'm disgusted. Yeah, believe me, I got in trouble. I got in trouble for making a video where some senator, he stuttered. And I clarified what he said, and uh, and that people were wrong for for saying that the the senator was said something nefarious. 
He was just saying something innocently to children, ch ch children. And there were people saying that he was saying something else. All right. People said that he was saying something really bad. If I repeat it, I'll get banned forever on YouTube, I think. But they removed the video because I pointed this out and I said, Hey, he's not saying what some people are claiming he said. He just stuttered. And I, I, for the life of me, I don't understand how. They came to a weird conclusion that I was giving out false medical information. <laughs> I cannot understand it. I can't even explain it. That's how much I can't understand it. But here, John Hagee, as bold as can be, talking about the government, 9-11, or uh, COVID-19, or whatever. I don't know what the heck's going on. COVID-19, government. I'm guessing that he's... Knowing John Hagee, he's probably blaming the Democrats. Because he wants to be a voice for Republicans. And he wants um, people to donate money to uh, Christ-rejecting people. You know who I'm talking about? All right. Ah, uh, so what are we talking about here? Armageddon and the Prince of Darkness. What's he saying? Satan has authority. Satan has authority. What did you say? What's he talking about here? He's talking a lot about Satan. God is here. The next appearance of the new world order is when Satan says to Jesus, if you will. Uh, okay, so he, Satan offered him the. All the, you know, the, what was that? Mark 4. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these. Uh, am I wrong here? I don't know nothing. Is it Luke 4, Matthew 4? Oh, no, no, I'm way off, ain't I? Of course I am. I don't know nothing. Don't know nothing. Alright, let's get back on track, boys. Let's get on track. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. No, that's not it. That's not it. Um, and the devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. All the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And say, if unto him all these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Alright? Alright, so, uh, what's John Hagee say? Um, his kingdom. And Satan, who is Prince of Darkness. Master. He is the master. John he says Satan is the master. All right. Okay. I, I disagree. All right. All right. You know that'd be interesting. Here, let me go back. Give you the kingdoms of this world, and believe me, Satan was cast out of heaven, given the earth, and it was his to give. He became the prince of darkness. Prince is anyone who has authority in his kingdom. And when Satan, who is the prince of darkness, gets in darkness, he is the master. Where there is spiritual darkness. Okay. Satan is the master. Is that true? Of course, this will take... Uh, my dial-up is exceedingly fast so no worries here 
184 mentions. It take a pretty serious study, I think, to. I don't recall. Oh God! Oh. I'm gonna have to cut it off here. We got war. <laughs>